Please welcome to the stage Marcelo Claure, founder and CEO of Claure Group and executive chairman and managing partner of Bicycle Capital, along with our moderator, Patricia Menendez Gambo, director of PMC Capital Partners, who will engage in a Bravo leadership conversation to discuss how Bicycle Capital seeks to empower exceptional founders and boost Latin America's entrepreneurial potential. Hi. So it's really my pleasure to be here with my friend, my former boss, and um, who needs very little introduction, Marcelo Claude, one of the most preeminent investors in the, re in the region. Marcelo, recently you have been very active in Latin America. You had, um, you've started a fund, Bicycle, to invest in growth entrepreneurs. You've taken a GP position at EB Capital, and you have become a global key person for Shine. So you've kind Sheen. of seen, seen. You've gone back to your roots of being a global and multi-industry actor. Why do you continue being so bullish on LATAM? And why do you think investing in LATAM is a great opportunity right now? Great. So it's, it's good to be here. It's good to see so many old friends that we've had a chance to work together. Uh, and you know, our Latin America dream began a few years back. Because I do believe that us as Latin Americans, if we don't promote Latin America, nobody else will. And I'm a strong believer that Latin America is one of those few regions where the opportunities in many cases are greater than capital. And we are, I would say we are going to have a few good years ahead due to the macro trends that are happening today in today's global macro economy. When I look at Latin America, I see that the current geopolitical situation between China and the US has forced a lot of companies to rethink their supply chain. And today, Mexico is a prime example of that, out of which you cannot find a single distribution center or a warehouse or a truck due to the fact that you've had so many different companies relocate to Latin America in order to bring their supply chain that's closer to its customers. And if, if you follow data, last month it was announced that now Mexico is the US largest trading partner, basically surpassing China, and that hasn't happened in many years. So I like that macro trend. Secondly, we're going to go, there's so many bold statements that have been made as it relates to energy transition or the ecological transition, as some call it. But what's expected to happen is that the world will get electrified in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And we're lucky at Latin America to have most of the critical resources, most of the critical minerals that would power that energy transition, called it lithium, copper, nickel, and so on. And Latin America today holds, in many cases, 40, 50, 60 percent of those essential minerals. And then thirdly, as population has gotten bigger, there's, going to, there's a food scarcity issue. And today, Latin America is one of the largest producers of food, soybeans, corn, beef, and so on. So when you look at this macro trend, it's something that we've never had before. So I think that's going to be incredibly helpful. And from a technology perspective, and, and I live this every day, with what I do at Shane, we, we, live, we have an incredible population who's always willing to adopt technology. So we're young, and it's a, it's a population that's willing to adapt technology if technology is going to make their life better. So when I look at all these trends, it's definitely something that I want to be part of. I want to not only invest, but be able to help entrepreneurs be able to develop business in Latin America, a region that I'm completely bullish on and one that I want to make sure I play the key role going forward. So that, that brings a good, you know, I think a good perspective as a, you know, an entrepreneur and a seasoned operator, you know, looking at it from the outside, you have, you know, made Shine a Latin American company in their operations as opposed to a foreign company doing business in Latin America. And you've taken a different approach um, with respect to that. Why is, you know, and it's been very successful. What are the benefits for the stockhold, you know, for the stakeholders in that in really becoming Latin American as opposed to being a foreign company operating in the region? Yeah. So Shein to me, 
Tariq calls it shine, and a lot of sheen, people call it shine. Sheen. To me, it's <laughs> Shane. Uh, to me, Shane is probably one of the most fascinating companies in the world that exists today. And this was a good example of a company that wanted to have a good business in Latin America, but didn't fully understand how to do business in Latin America, especially in a complicated country like Brazil, where there's always taxation issues and, and other issues. And for those who don't know Sheen, you know, I think the easiest way for me to describe it, there's old fashion, which is a traditional fashion that you find when you go to a mall and, and you go buy your stuff. There's fast fashion, which is companies like Uniqlo or Zara or H&M who took old fashion and just became faster. And I like to call Sheen as new fashion. And it's a company that designs product, manufactures and ships product within a seven day time frame, which makes the ability also to make about three to 5,000 new products a day. And we're able to just pretty much bespoke and design product based on what customer needs are. Uh, when you translate that to a market like Brazil, who's traditionally had been a, a, a difficult economy in terms of importing products and all that, and when you take the macro trends of nearshoring, we figure out that we were going to test a model in Brazil that had never been tested outside. You know, Sheen, even though we have thousands of designers all over the world, we, do, we used to do most of our manufacturing in China, if not all. And we decided why not test a model by bringing local manufacturing into a place like Brazil. So Brazil became the second country in the world for a company like Sheen to start doing local manufacturing. And we made a commitment to uh, what I call uh, that those are the new companies, agile companies. And we made a commitment to open 2,000 factories in Brazil and do it in two years. And four months later, yesterday we reported that we already have over 330 factories in only four months. And, in, and that's also another prime example of a market like Brazil, who's completely digital. Today, you know, sh we have over 45 million customers in Brazil who've downloaded our app, who basically their entire fashion needs are, are sourced by us. And that's just a perfect example of a global company who's, you know, who sells in 150 different countries who had to take a different approach if they wanted to be the key player in Brazil, and that is to bring local manufacturing to Brazil. And that's you know, another great example of you know, how global companies have to adapt, in many cases, their supply chain, the way they do business, when they move to countries like Latin America, and why it's important to be that bridge or the corridor between China, in this case, China and Latin America, or I mean, there are great companies flourishing all over the world, that when they go to Latin America, they need to either partner or have local partners that will help them, in many cases, replicate what they've been successful in other parts of the world. Well, and it's that ecosystem that you helped create four and a half years ago that invested in all the technology in Brazil. So it's interesting to see how you're taking advantage of the ecosystem and the operations. So in, on your other roles that you have is investing in entrepreneurs. Um, how do you envision the next generation of entrepreneurs emerging from Latin America? I think Latin America needed and I, I take a lot of pride at what we did at SoftBank. SoftBank, from day one, we set up, the, we set up a strategy that was say, let's equalize Latin America. Let's make sure that the Latin American entrepreneurs have the same uh, opportunities that entrepreneurs all over, the play, all over the world have had. And that was mainly around capital. But once you have the right amount of capital in Latin America, that is powering, you know, called entrepreneurs who have shown that it's all possible, that Latin America can create the same type of entrepreneurs that are other parts in the world. And then when you start looking at what has happened in Latin America, it's, so, it's fascinating. You look at the amount of exits that have happened in Latin America as a percentage of total capital deployed. We have one of the highest in the world, if not the highest in the world, which means this has been a market that has been traditionally underinvested within venture growth equity, but we've had some great exits. And I, Probably the one that everybody knows and everybody talks about, which is one of many, is Nubank, right? Nubank is today the world's most valuable digital bank. It's the one with the highest penetration. And that's one that's been proven that whenever you bring the right product to a population in Brazil or in Latin America, you can build a long-term sustainable business. That is similar. I would like to give the example, you know, Nubank is to banking what Shein is to fashion. 
right? You're bringing a different set of entrepreneurs with a different set of ambitions That's that are customer-driven companies that are not solving on what is important for the company. But in this case, you know, what Nubank does is they build a product that was solving, you know, what their customers needed. And I always say, you know, Shane is solving a problem of either co those are customer-driven organizations who are designing product in both cases for what are the customer needs. And you know, what, once that happens, once you have that big exit, once you see Mercado Libre thriving and being one of the best e-commerce companies in the world, once you go to Brazil and you see a company like iFood, who is you know, the preeminent winner within the food delivery, that creates a culture of other entrepreneurs who want to follow their tracks. And that creates, you know, you need dreamers like those that were able to build businesses. And that creates what I call a thriving community that starts in the early stage you know, Latin America today has one of the best early stage ecosystems where you have some incredible funds who do a great job of putting that first check, that seed capital, that Series A. And where we're trying to position ourselves with, seed ca with a bicycle is what we like to call growth equity. Those are companies that have already been funded, that have a proven business model, but need that extra check, that 50 to $100 million check that traditional was lacking in Latin America. And once you do that, then you have pre-IPO you know, pre funds and others that will allow those companies to potentially exit. But to me, if you needed those winners, you needed those new banks on Mercado Libre, those Globant, uh, Kabak, and others, in order to rapi, that in order to create that dream for people to want to decide to become entrepreneurs in Latin America. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. What, you know, when, when looking, and you're looking at ideas, there's so many things to be disruptive in the region. What are the key qualities that you look for in an entrepreneur? So it's the same always, right? You want that, you know, those people that have the ability to dream big, who are going to play in an industry that is particularly broken, that needs that level of innovation and disruption, and more importantly, entrepreneurs that can build great teams. Because when you're investing in, in entrepreneurs, at one point in time, anything that they show you, you know is going to be different. You know that they're going to have to overcome a substantial amount of obstacles. And there are those special entrepreneurs who won't give up, who will persevere, and who will adapt to the changing needs in order for them to thrive. And you know, I've been very lucky my entire life to have been surrounded by incredible entrepreneurs. And you always find that common thread, and that is dreamers who are relentless, who don't give up, who are playing in markets that, that are urge the need of doing, you know, of bringing new different business models. And with the advent of technology and artificial intelligence and so many different things happening, you know, today, you know, I, I think the cost of disruption is lower than ever, right? When you, when you see what Gen AI is doing to the world in terms of bringing the ability to problem solve that to, before it was just left to just us, to humans to do it, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of disruption coming in the next few years in pretty much in everything that we do. So in today's world of new entrepreneurs and, and growth companies, they're facing different macroeconomic conditions that were the last five years in the region. And you have been an experienced operator in the region for many years. What advice do you have for them, you know, in operating in these times as opposed to, you know, the last cycle? I think when you're building businesses, yes, you do want to have a general view of macro political issues and microeconomic issues you're going to have, but you're solving a bigger issue. You're, you know, you're solving to make a customer lives better in whatever you're going to do, and whatever you're solving needs to be bigger than any political issue, any currency issue that we're always going to have, that those are quite common of Latin America. And when you're building a product that is going to solve you know, you know a, big, a, a big issue in somebody's life that is always going to be bigger than any political issue or any currency issue or inflation and so on. And then when you see all these great businesses that have been born in the last few years, the winners, those have always been bigger than any issue, any, any political issue. And as an entrepreneur, you always got to put your focus on areas that you can solve, right? When you're building a company, you cannot solve political issues, you cannot solve currency issues, you cannot solve macro issues you're incredibly focused on solving a specific issue that in many cases is going to be way bigger than any of the crises that we're so, issued to, that we're so used to living 
especially within Latin America. Now, what I find fascinating is, uh, I always tell this to the Latin American entrepreneurs, you know, if you can be successful in Brazil, which is a complicated country from a tax perspective, from a logistical perspective, regulatory, you know, regulatory perspective, you know, you're going to be successful in any other market that you go to. And I think that is a perfect example of Nubank who were able to solve issues in Brazil. And today, as they start expanding to other parts, they find it incredibly easier. I always cite, you know, my own personal example. When I, when I was an entrepreneur, still an entrepreneur, but when I did my first company, we had to solve logistical issues in Brazil, which were quite, quite complex. And as we moved down to other parts of the world where things were done a lot easier, it was a lot easier to grow the company because in Brazil you were solving to the most difficult circumstances. And we're going to find, hopefully, other entrepreneurs that have the ability to grab business models that were created in Latin America and then be able to export it to other parts of the world. I think a perfect example in the tech world, you know, is a company called Gympass who's been able to develop a, a pretty creative business model within Brazil, within the health and wellness sector. And today, as they expand to the United States, to Europe, to other parts of Latin America, it's easy to replicate a business model that was born in Brazil and be able to take it to other parts of the world. So you have been a mentor to so many in the region, you know, the CEO of Jim Pass and many, you know, the new unicorns today are there because you believed in them and invested in them, you know, in the last, um, you know, in your last fund. Who was your mentor? Who was your inspiration? Because when you did this, I've been lucky to be surrounded by, by a lot of people that, that I've learned, right? I always cite the example of, in my previous company, we invented something that all, to all of you seems so logical, and that is, I always say, the buyback and trading phones. The fact that you can sell your used iPhone and then be able to get money and buy a new one. And that whole story began with a conversation with Steve Jobs, who was totally against Apple buying a, buying a used iPhone and allow us to resell it. And the, the, the sessions I had with him was fascinating of how do you actually perfect the product. So I was incredible. I was blessed to do that. You know, I've been blessed to be given the opportunity by Mass at SoftBank to believe in me, buy my company, and make me the CEO of Sprint, right? And, and those were incredible opportunities that were given to me that allowed me to, to uh, you know, that allowed me to do what I did when I was at Sprint, and then we did the T-Mobile merger, who now is the world's most valuable telecommunications company. You know, I was given the chance to say, hey, Latin America is 8% of the world's GDP. You know, why don't we launch an $8 billion fund? So I've been lucky to be surrounded by people who have given me trust, you know, where, where they believe in a vision that I set forward. And I would say those were always my mentors, you know, people who, and I've had, I've had so many stories of, of people like that, and I think there's there's a, there's so many learnings from people who you interact and who uh, you know they later give trust in you that allows you to test new funds, new models, new things that that today some of them have actually changed the way we live. So blessed by the many opportunities that have been given to me. Well, but you've always been a big proponent of pay it forward. I mean, going back to. 15 years ago with one lap per child. I mean, no matter how hard you work and how many endeavors you take, you have always managed to focus on assisting other people. Um, how can that, how is that, um, that role modeling thing? Everybody's looking at you from an entrepreneur, but people don't realize all the incredibly um, charitable and philanthropic things that you have done over the years and you're a role model to so many entrepreneurs what do you think the future entrepreneurs can learn from that i think uh, i always tell people you know give without asking and the world is a i think the world is a fair place you know the more you give without expectations of receiving you know life has a way of giving it all back to you and if you consider, you know, I sh I'm not supposed to be here, right? I came from Bolivia with very little money, and I was very lucky to have been part of building, you know, two world's number one companies. And it's always nice to say, hey, you can go home and tell your grandkids, you know, hey, I was a global champion in my own sports, right? 
So that, that's, that's always been an important part to just give back as much as you can. You know, we invented something many years back that was called the one laptop per child. And all it took was, you know, a scientist called Nicolas Negroponte who ran the MIT Media Lab, and he showed me how, how was the profitability of a laptop. And I remember that, that the profitability was very high, so we figured what if we could make a laptop for $100 from scratch. And we designed, and we got some of the world's best scientists, and with the only goal of giving those laptops to kids who didn't have access to the internet. I'm a huge proponent that we should all have the same connectivity because the internet is basically you're democratizing information. And that was a dream, and you know, a few years later, three million kids all over the world had access to our, to our, we call it one laptop per child, and our goal was to give kids who couldn't afford a laptop. Then when I went to Sprint, it drove me nuts that there were five million kids in the United States, you know, what was supposed to be a pretty advanced country that didn't have access to the internet, but, they were, but their homework was given to them and they needed access to the internet. They went home and they didn't have access to the internet. And what bothered me most is that most of these kids were black or Hispanic. So I figured at a sprint, I had a network. I convinced my, the guys who used to sell me phones and computers to give me back their used phones. And we launched what was called the One Million Project, in which we give away one million free laptops and cell phones, mainly Hispanic kids all over the United States. And we gave them free connectivity. And then we followed the career of some of those. And and I, it fills me with so much pride that those kids, women, they were, they were going to outside of McDonald's, they were getting in the wrong business, they were turning to prostitutes, guys were turning to drug dealers because they didn't have something as basic as something that we take for granted that was having internet access at home. And we fixed that. And when I did the Sprint and T-Mobile merger, I made a condition that T-Mobile will continue that. And we made that instead of being 1 million, we made it 10 million. And today, due to T-Mobile, we have eradicated what I call a disease, a problem, that every kid that needs access to the internet, today we will give them free access to the internet, which is something that I take a lot of pride to have helped so many people. And life is good. You know, I'm in a great position because I've been able to give to others. And, and life just balances it out. It's a, it's a good thing of life. No, that's, that's great. But that's very much of your core because that's something that you did at the very beginning when you were starting your own company. Others would have just focused on the for-profit side. You managed to balance both. So with all the demands that you have on a global basis for Sheen and all of the demands that you have that you've put on yourself to help the next level of entrepreneurs in Latin America, I know personally that you're very involved with your family. So I think, you know, how do you balance that for people? Because mo people don't realize how committed you are to your family. So I think well. there's three things that matter, right? One is family first. And, uh, and I, I've, I've changed my mind, right? I'm lucky I have six kids. And at the beginning, like every father, I have one boy and five girls. And like every father, we all want to send him to the best universities and we all want to make him better than what we are. And I've changed my mind. You know, my only goal now is to raise good human beings. And if it happens to be that they end up being great entrepreneurs or great leaders or they go to great institutions, uh, two of my kids actually went to UM. Uh, you know, my new goal in, 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 in kids, in families, to just raise good human beings. And if they happen to be great leaders, so be it. But I think it's important today to recognize how important it is to just bring good human beings. So that's one priority. My second priority is my football teams. You know, I, I, I love- I, I love, was gonna ask. I love football, <laughs> I, or as we, as we call it in this country, soccer. I love to see what's happening with Inter Miami, which was my team. I, 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 I take a lot of pride in bringing football to Miami, then I sold that team, but I'm incredibly proud to see that Miami finally has a competitive football team and people are paying attention to it. I own a team in, in Spain called Girona, which for those of you who don't follow La Liga, we're number two now ahead of Barcelona, ahead of Atletico Madrid. And it shows it's the exact, exact same thing in business. If you actually have a big dreams, you put a good plan, you know, you can accomplish. I always tell people our payroll is $45 million, Real Madrid is 500 million, and we are one point away from them. And we were leaders last week, now they're leaders this week. And then my third area, which today is the most, I would say, and also a very important part is, 
you know, I don't want to be a CEO of another big company. I've had the chance to do that. I'm dedicated the next few years to basically grab the capital that I've locally earned, combined with the experience that I've accumulated in my 32 years of working and building great companies, and be able to pass that on to entrepreneurs and to fund managers in different companies that I invest. But my goal now is how can you create an exponential effect? You know, how can I grab everything that I've learned and be able to pass it to others so they can do what I've done in a much bigger, in a, in a much bigger arena and be able to do it much better than I've done in the past? So family, football, and my work, those are my three <laughs> priorities. Yeah. Well, thank, I think we're out of time, Marcel, but thank you very much. You're an inspiration to many here, and you know I'll, I'll be looking forward to see how you take Sheen from this level, which is already successful, to the next one and the next wave of entrepreneurs that you identify in the region and see their success. Great. Thank, thank you, you very everybody. much. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Huh?